is uh, I, I sent an email out yesterday just letting you know of a couple of things that are coming up with lab tomorrow. Um, I've got a stack here of these group effort analysis sheets. I want you to grab enough for you to be able to write one for yourself and then also your lab partners. So if you are in a group of four, take four. If you're in a group of three, take three, so on and so forth. Bring these with you to lab tomorrow, and then I'll go ahead and take a look at them after the fact. Um, again, these ones don't really carry any sort of weight in terms of grading. It's just me for me to kind of see what's going on within those groups behind the scenes. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm observant enough to pick up on some things that are going on, but I may not be picking up on everything. So that's the, that's the first thing that I wanted to make sure to address. Um, second, if you need to start cultures for lab today, make sure to get those going. Tomorrow's the last day that we really have planned to run the experiment. Um, if you need to run one more trial next week on Tuesday, you have the ability to do so, though... And what I'm really trying to get you guys to do by next week, Tuesday, is get into the analysis portion of the project. So if you need to run more trials, that's fine. Use the rest of the time in lab as a way to work on analysis. Um, and then next week, too, we'll begin to talk about that final poster presentation uh, so that you have a heads up of what to expect for that. Okay. Um, what I wanted to start with today is actually to touch base with something that I didn't finish discussing. I don't think, think I really did a great job of discussing on Monday, which was uh, cytokines and chemokines and these signaling molecules. Uh, we're not going to talk about specific types of cytokines. There's hundreds of them. And quite honestly, many of them have redundant functions. <coughs> And some are activators of the immune response. Those are primarily how we talk about them in this class. But there are also some that function as repressors of the immune response as well. So the immune response basically has some checks and balances built in. But the way you can think of cytokines is that whenever a, an immune cell, whether it be a macrophage, a T cell, a B cell, a neutrophil, whenever they recognize something foreign, one of the results of that recognizing foreign material is secreting these cytokines. And cytokines are small molecules that will bind to the surface of other cells and activate them in some way. So this just gives you a flavor of a few of them. The IL here stands for interleukin, which is the name of another name for cytokines. Uh, CXCL8 is another one. And then we have the tumor necrosis factors, which include TNF-alpha. Um, the, the other ones that you might see commonly are IFNs or interferons. These are involved in mostly antiviral response, more than in, in uh, response to a bacterial pathogen. We already commented that chemokines are the chemical att uh, attractors. So that's how we, for example, from the initial site of inflammation, macrophages recruit neutrophils with these chemokines. Um, and then interleukins, basically what we're reading there is it alters the behavior or it activates cells in order to respond to an immune response. In some ways, what that means is that in the case of macrophages, their exposure to cytokines turns them in from, it turns them from like slightly eating or slightly undergoing phagocytosis to really ramping up that process and increasing not only the rate at which phagocytosis occurs, but also the rate of breakdown of microorganisms in those phagolysosomes. Um, so, yeah. We'll leave it at that for, for right now. We'll come back to these because we'll see these uh, reoccur actually a little bit later today when we talk about T cells. So to get us started, what I, let's see if that's what I wanted to do. Yes. Okay, I'm going to put together a table to get us started. And then what I would like is for you to work in groups of two or three and list the characteristics. We're going to take about three minutes to do this. 
Um, just to give you a quick idea of what we're going to be covering today, the main goal is T cells today. T helper, T cytotoxic. The last thing that we'll refer to if we have time is talking about NK cells. Um, and we'll talk about antibodies and B cells on, on Friday. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to start a table looking at T helper and T cytotoxic cells. And I want you to describe or to just put in a single word or phrase to describe or complete these prompts. CD blank. MHC blank. I want you to tell me about the response or how these cells respond to identification of pathogen. I want you to tell me what they secrete or what they release from the cells. And then the last is who do they interact with? So what other cells do these interact with in responding to a pathogen? And so this kind of recapitulates some of the, the homework assignment. So I'll give you, let's go to 1109. I'll give you about three minutes to work on this. Or in part, it, it, we sometimes give them different names that are based on their expression of what we call the CD co-receptor. Okay. Um, which one, and, and there are two numbers, four and eight, which of those two associates with T helper cells? Uh, not eight. Four for T helper. And cytotoxic, eight. These are important because what these two actually do is they recognize what we call the MHC, or the major histocompatibility complex. And we really haven't talked about what that is just yet. But we're going to come back to it in a few minutes. One of these, CD4 or CD8, interacts with MHC1, and the other interacts with MHC2 specifically. Anybody know which one 4 interacts with? It interacts with 2. And MHC1 is going to interact with CD8. So if you're starting to think about, okay, how do I start looking at this information or how do I start memorizing this information, there are, there are uh, things that will always be true here. CD4 will always be found on T helper cells. It will always interact with cells that are expressing MHC2. Cytotoxic T cells, on the other hand, are always going to have CD8 they will always interact with cells that have MHC1. Okay, we'll come back to these specific patterns a little bit later. Um, let's go to the last one then. What, who do they interact with? There are only a subset of cells in the immune system or in our body in general that express MHC2. Those are going to be macrophages. Macrophages are the major one. B cells also express MHC2, and that's something we'll come back to on, on Friday. On the other hand, every single nucleated cell, in other words, everything except red blood cells, should express MHC1. Now, the last two that we're covering here is the response and what they're secreting. Let's start with the secretion because that actually helps to define what the response is. When CD4 cells become activated, when they identify a foreign pathogen, does anybody know how they respond or what they release from them? What's that? Main release, cytokines. The helper cell, as the name would imply, its goal is to help the immune system. It's kind of like, if you want to think of it in terms of like a role or a function, its job is kind of like to oversee the rest of the immune response. The T helper is telling which cells should be activated in order to respond to a pathogen or to an infection. TC, on the other hand, what does the C stand for? 
cytotoxic. And that gives us an idea of what it does. What do these T cytotoxic cells do? Yeah, kill the infected cells. Oops, I, this is, uh, so yeah, so the response of those T cytotoxic is kill. And they do so by, re, by secreting two different enzymes, or two different molecule, proteins. One is called perforin, and the other is known as granzyme. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these. So this is kind of a table that you can come back to and refer to again and again. What we're going to do now is we're going to break this down and see where did these events take place, how did they take place. Okay. Anybody know what um, system in the body connects kind of all the macrophages and T cells or what system becomes activated in our body in response to an infection? Has anybody had mono? I have. When, and when somebody gets mono or when somebody gets sick, what becomes swollen? Spleen becomes swollen. That's absolutely true. What else? Lymph nodes. The lymph system connects all immunology. Okay? The lymph nodes in the spleen are sites where we find interactions between macrophages and T helper cells. So we talked about on Monday how macrophages and neutrophils are recruited to a site of infection. After that recruitment, the next step is that macrophages will move out of the tissue, enter into the lymphatic system, and end up localizing within lymph nodes. And they'll just stay there in the closest lymph node. What happens is we've got circulating T cytotoxic and T helper cells that probably every 24 hours are making a full lap through every single lymph node in the body. And when they run into a macrophage where that T helper cell or T cytotoxic cell recognizes that pathogen or a piece of that pathogen, that's where they become activated. So really what we're going to be looking at are events that are taking place inside those lymph nodes. So here's what is going to happen. Um, just kind of to recall what we talked about on Monday, we said, hey, these macrophages eat, they eat, they eat, and then most of this debris gets released. But some of it doesn't. Some of it gets presented on the surface of a cell. The image that always comes to my mind when I think of this are medieval movies when the end result of a war is putting your enemy's head on a stake. That is exactly what's happening here. The microbes, pieces of the microbes, are being presented on the surface of the cell as a warning sign to the immune system that there's an infection occurring. All right. Macrophages, or organisms that perform phagocytosis, are going to present pathogens on what we call MHC2. And that's what this is here. So MHC2 and MHC1 stand for major histocompatibility complex. You don't need to know the full name. And what these do is they basically hold short fragments of protein, maybe 13 to 20 amino acids long. MHC2 presents pathogens that have been engulfed and have been phagocytized. MHC1 presents pathogens that have actually undergone replication inside of a cell. So let's take that back to the context of, of bacteria real quick. Most bacteria don't replicate inside host cells, but they will be phagocytized by macrophages and broken down. In other words, many bacteria are presented on MHC2s. What kind of pathogens might we find more often presented on MHC1? Which ones have to make their way into host cells in order to replicate? And I'll give you a hint. It's not bacteria, but it's something we talked about. Virus. Viruses. Viruses have to gain entry into our cells in order to replicate. And so because of that, many viruses are actually presented on MHC1. All right, so let's talk about this MHC2 real quick. 
and its interaction with those T helpers. So what we have is a macrophage. I'll label him or her as M. Let's assume that the macrophage has identified a foreign pathogen. It takes its PRRs, binds to those pattern associated or pathogen associated molecular patterns, engulfs, phagocytizes, breaks down that pathogen, and now presents some of that pathogen on its surface. So here is our MHC, and here is part of that pathogen, this little triangular thing here. Now that pattern or that, that piece that gets presented on the surface isn't going to be the same on every single MHC2 complex because bacteria we know have 5,000 genes, which means at any time we've got about 2,000 different proteins being produced. That means that there are potentially 2,000 or more different pieces of the bacteria that could be recognized or presented on the cell surface. So we might have a macrophage presenting a triangle or presenting a square, a rectangle, I guess, or a circle. Okay. And any of these could be recognized by different T helper cells. We're not going to get into the, into the detail of what leads to T helper cells being able to recognize these in the first place. We're just going to focus on the event where the recognition takes place. Every T cell, T helper and T cytotoxic, have on their surface um, what we call a T cell receptor or a TCR. And each T cell has a unique TCR. And so what I'm drawing here are three examples of T cells, each with a different T cell receptor. And so what you can see here already is that the macrophage actually can very quickly amplify the immune response. And the way that it does so is if it can interact with all three of these T cells that recognize different parts of this pathogen, well, right there, we've got three different T cells that can all <coughs> respond in helping the immune response. <coughs> so this is that T cell receptor. The second thing that has to be recognized, there's actually two events. It's kind of like a lock and key model here. This is where that co-receptor comes into play. Each of these T helper cells contain on their surface CD4. And the function of CD4 is to recognize MHC2. Both of these events have to happen simultaneously. The T cell receptor has to recognize the specific antigen or the specific piece of a virus or bacteria. And CD4 has to recognize MHC2. This is telling them, that T cell, that, hey, we are interacting with a macrophage that is presenting this pathogen. Okay? So at this point, then, the T cell responds. And the T cell responds in a, in a couple of ways, all revolving around the secretion of cytokines. Some of those cytokines will be used to stimulate the macrophage, increase phagocytosis. <coughs> Some of those will stimulate the T cell itself, proliferate, produce more T cells, leave the lymph node and now start traveling the body to try and find or to try and interact with other cells that may be recognizing the same pathogen. And then the third is going to be to um, more of a, there will be signaling to other immune cells like neutrophils, other macrophages, maybe even B cells, which we'll take a look at later as well. But most of these interactions or these responses are in close connection. So either autocrine signaling to itself or paracrine signaling with the cell right across from it. Okay. 
And that's the main function of those T helpers, is just to secrete these cytokines as a way to enhance the activity of macrophages, enhance T cell production, amplify what we call the adaptive immune response, okay, which include those T helpers and uh, T cytotoxic and B cells. And I should also mention another group that would be activated would be those T cytotoxic. So in here, in this image here, we've then covered all five of those pieces we just talked about. MHC2 is the major histocompatibility complex that these cells are interacting with on macrophages, again, phagocytes. We've got CD4 as the co-receptor on those T helper cells, and their job is to secrete cytokines help regulate or modulate or activate the immune response. Okay. Questions on this uh, mode of activity? Sometimes the word that you'll see for macrophages, um, we, we've defined macrophages as being phagocytes. We've also defined neutrophils as being phagocytes. Neutrophils are not involved in this presentation process. They actually don't express MHC2. So sometimes the term that we can use to differentiate macrophages and um, neutrophils from each other is we can call macrophages and cells like them professional antigen-presenting cells. And PAPCs, or these professional antigen-presenting cells, are cells that will present antigen pathogens on MHC2. Let's take a look at one more example then. Let's take a look at those cytotoxic T cells. So let's imagine a viral uh, infection in this case. A virus is exp uh, makes its way into a cell, and this can be any old cell or young cell. And the cell is sad because it's, it's, it's sick. And every other cell in the body should be expressing MHC1. And just like with MHC2, the goal of this is to just present pieces of the pathogen on the surface. So the function of those two is exactly the same. So again, we might have a square, or not a square, something really crappy, a triangle, a circle. Any cytotoxic T cell that has a T cell receptor that can recognize one of these will dock up to this epithelial cell and kill it. All right. So let's take a look at how this happens. We'll just take a look at one example this time. So we have our T cell receptor on the surface of that T cell. We also have the co-receptor. CD8. And again, just like what we find with T helper cells, T cytotoxic need two signals to become active. One is recognizing the antigen. The second is recognizing the infected cell by binding to MHC1. The end result here is this, this T cell becomes quite angry, Hulk-like, I suppose and starts to secrete a couple of molecules. One of them is perforin, and perforin pokes holes in the cell membrane, starts to create pores. And we've talked about with bacterial cells how breaking of the cell membrane can start leading to like secretion or release of cytoplasmic material. So this is a really bad thing. The other thing that we find is that granzymes will get into these cells, and the role of granzymes is is to induce a process known as apoptosis, or apoptosis if you're going to say the incorrect way. All right. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. Sometimes the term that gets used is cell suicide. 
the goal here, well, somebody explain this to me. Why would that be of benefit? Why would a TC cell tell the, the cell to die? What, what's the use of that? Here's what I'm going to do. Go ahead, Taylor. So it doesn't like, replicate or pass on the bacteria genes to other cells? Basically, yes. This, if it's infected with a virus, becomes a viral factory. And if a TC cell is telling it to kill itself, then this cell no longer is a factory for replication. It's as if we are imploding the replication or the, the machinery itself. So in doing so, the goal is to block the infection from spreading by killing that infected cell. Now we have billions of cells in our body. Killing one really shouldn't be a bad thing. That's the idea. Sometimes it is. If you're talking about where this can be actually be quite detrimental is if you're talking about neurodegenerative diseases or neurodegenerative uh, infections, Zika virus, for example. So the end result then, this cell dies, this TC cell becomes a bit more active, or has been activated to be able to do this in the first place, and the TC cells can basically travel everywhere in the body, and this is their main function, seek and destroy, seek and destroy. Okay. So again, just to kind of recap the, the key players here. MHC1 presenting a pat or presenting pieces of a pathogen on any cell with a nucleus, any cell that can express MHC1. T cell receptor and in CD8, that co-receptor interacting with MHC1, and that TC is killing that now infected or host cell by secreting granzymes and perforin. Um, any questions? Okay. Let's take a look at one more example here of one other cell that uh, we often group with the innate immunity because it, or it, we're gonna we're gonna switch back to innate immunity for a minute um, and look at one more cell type. All right. So let's say there's a scenario where we've got, again, an epithelial cell. And there are some viruses that are very, very tricky. And what I mean by that is they actually will block MHC1 from being expressed on the surface of a cell. So you've got a cell that's infected with a virus. And normally, as we just talked about, if that virus is presented on the surface with or pieces of that virus are presented on the surface with MHC1. This cell is targeted for death. Well, oops, oh no, booger. Redraw my cell. Epithelial cell, infected, sad. And it doesn't express MHC1. Can the cell be recognized by a TC? So what, does the, what happens to the cell then? You could argue that the virus is just going to, that it's going to replicate, the virus is going to continue the infection. We do see that in some cases. Luckily, a lot of the immune system has a backup plan. There's a third class of cells that we're going to talk about today, which are known as the natural killers, the NK cells. Natural killers have a lot in common with TCs. They kill infected cells. They look for MHC1. But rather responding to the presence of MHC1, NK cells search or scan the surface of a cell. And if they can't find MHC1, they know something's wrong. Okay. So in other words, Let's say this is a cell here, sad, it's not infected. And K cells have this, re this receptor on their surface that um, it, it's technically, we call it a repressor uh, receptor. And its goal is that if it can bind to MHC1, 
it, it's kind of like a pacifier to a baby. What does a pacifier do to a crying baby? Shuts it yeah, exactly. It shuts off the NK cell. It stops it from doing anything. You take the pacifier away from the baby, and what happens? Cries. It cries. Or in this case, the NK cell secretes granzymes and perforin. So if MHC1 is not present, this NK cell responds the same way that TC cells would respond to the presence of a pathogen on MHC1. They secrete granzymes. They secrete perforin. And kill that cell. Because the absence of MHC1 on the cell surface is not normal. All of our cells have it. It's a signal that things are okay. And honestly, in most cases, even when presenting uh, material in that MHC1, our, most cells don't respond to it because it doesn't recognize those things as being foreign. The NK cell just responds to the absence of it altogether. Kelly? So when you're talking about how MHC1 is found on like all cells except for red blood cells, what would happen if, it's, if an NK cell came in contact with a red blood cell? You know, I'm always wondering that because I don't know the answer. I have to figure that out. Okay. I will, if I can figure it out, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, you're the first one to actually have asked that question, which means I had a good two-year run. So, um, <laughs> let me see if I can figure that out. I'll get back to you on it. <coughs> okay. So, oh, go ahead, Taylor. So what happens when bacteria or viruses hijack, like, uh, lymphatic cells? Do the NK cells begin to attack the bacteria and lymphatic cells? I suppose so. I, I suppose that would be possible. Most, I'm trying to remember how NK cells respond, and most of them don't respond in the same, it, they don't necessarily travel the, the lymphatic system in the same way that, that TH and TC will localize to those locations until they're activated. NK cells are more kind of transitory or, or moving all the time. That's, a, it's a good question though. I would assume that if, if a lymphatic cell, like if a cell that makes up the lymph node particularly is infected and it, there's a loss of MHC1 expression, yes, technically the NK cell would be able to identify that and kill it. You know, to potentially death of that lymph node, depending on how many cells are infected. I don't know how common that is, though, to be honest. I don't know of a virus that infects lymphatic tissue per se. We know that some viruses localize the lymphatic tissue, but that's because the cells that they infect are T cells and B cells. Epstein-Barr virus infects B cells. And when those cells undergo massive proliferation as a result of EBV, that's what leads to the swollen lymph nodes. Uh, T cells infected by HIV. But specifically to ones that infect the lymphatic tissue, I don't really know. It's a good question. All right. Let's take a look at a couple of examples, real life examples then. How about we do the first one here, um, just to get us started. So KSHV, or Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus, it's a member of the herpes virus family. Honestly, uh, it probably infects about 50% of individuals. Most people don't know they have it. Where it becomes particularly concerning is in immunocompromised individuals, um, particularly HIV positive patients, this is one of the common diseases that AIDS patients will succumb to. Uh, so KSHV produces a viral mimic of interleukin-10. In other words, it produces a gene or a protein that looks a lot and behaves a lot like the human interleukin-10 or that cytokine. IL-10 is a suppressive cytokine and it blocks the expression of MHC2 and inhibits T cell proliferation. 
what effect is this going to have on Th cells, and what benefit does this have for the virus? Okay, so take the, let's go ahead and just take three minutes and jot down a couple of notes for yourself based on what we've talked about in the context of today. How does this benefit the virus? What does this do to the immune response? What cells particularly are going to be affected by this mechanism? This is going to maybe minimize, uh, that's not how I want to draw this. Give me a second, sorry. So here's our macrophage, and then another macrophage plus that viral IL-10. Normally, let's say a macrophage has on its surface five MHC2 complexes, each of them capable of presenting a, path a piece of a pathogen. With viral IL-10, how many will, will there be? None, less than five. Let's say there's just a single one. What does this do to the ability of T helper cells to respond? What was that? I didn't hear. I honestly didn't hear. Come on. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Okay, or there's a, there's a reduced number of chances that you might get an interaction between a T cell that recognizes one pathogen or one piece of a pathogen versus one that's presenting five different parts of that pathogen. Pentagon. Something else. So what this does is it reduces the amount of material that can be presented on the surface. Therefore, it reduces the number of chances that we have for a T helper cell to be activated from this response. What this, what's this going to do then? Overall, if we think about this in the context of like the whole immune system or the response to this pathogen, what does this do? Yeah, exactly. Fewer T helper, and let's walk through the steps that lead to that. Fewer T helper cells will bind to the pathogen on the surface, meaning there's fewer T helper cells releasing what? Cytokines. Meaning since there's less cytokines around, fewer macrophages will be activated, and fewer TC cells and fewer B cells will be activated as a result of this. Overall, the effect is a suppression of the immune system, allowing for this virus to go undetected. Okay. So if you're thinking about strategies, right, about how would you block this, well, you maybe you want to block the virus from expressing IL-10, for example. Or give a pro-inflammatory, uh, pro, not suppressive, but activating cytokine as a way to kind of enhance the immune system would be a treatment. A lot of viruses play on this, different mechanisms to do this. We won't go through the other one, but I'll just show you, kind of give you guys an opportunity to think about this one outside of class. Um, no, cancel. Um, so this last one here, some viruses like human cytomegalovirus, which is another herpes virus family member it prevents MHC1 from maturing and even making it to the surface of the cell. And so given what we talked about this, what we talked about with MHC1, the question becomes, are these cells more likely to be recognized by NK or TC cells? Well, yeah, because NK recognizes the absence of MHC1. Okay? So we've got a backup mechanism is the main point there. Um, there, so what, we, what we've done today then, if you want to just kind of think about this in retrospect, we've taken the first part of what we call the innate immune response. Macrophages, neutrophils, their phagocytosis, and inflammation. And we've moved into talking about the adaptive immune response. T cells, T helper and T cytotoxic, and then NK cells. One key takeaway point, I don't think we've really touched on this yet, but T cells don't recognize molecular patterns. They recognize specific features of 
a pathogen. And it's not as if we have in our bodies a Rolodex, which is really old term. Does anybody actually know what the hell a Rolodex is? Okay, let me try this a different way. Uh, a Facebook page with all of your contacts. Yes, contact page. That's the one I was looking for. It's not as if we have a contact page where we know, hey, here are 2 million different bacterial species. We need to create T cells that attack well, all of these. That's not what happens. It's actually more of a random process where T cells get created and each one that gets created is going to recognize a different piece of a single pathogen. Okay, so you have inside of you right now, if you've ever had um, a cold virus, you have T cells, T helper and T cytotoxic, that recognize pieces of that cold virus. Or if you've ever had an ear infection caused by a bacterium, you have T helper and T cytotoxic cells that have specific receptors that recognize parts of that bacterial pathogen. It's different than a molecular path, more specific. Typically, T cells are recognizing proteins. Okay? And that's what gets presented on the cell surface. All right, I will leave it at that for today. Um, the plan for Friday is we're going to talk about B cells. And if I remember correctly, I think the homework, i got to double check this, but I think it's a group wiki. Um, I need to post that because I have not done that yet. So I will take care of that right away. But it's basically a what's the function and uh, what's the morphological characteristics of these different types of cells that we talk about. So it's a bit review. It's a bit new. All right. All right. Have a great afternoon. Oh, I have exams. Yeah. So pick those up as you're walking out. Well, I was going to ask you. Well, what's the average there? Seventy-three. Thank you. Lindsay, I have yours right there. Emma? Yours. Adam.